What is up, clean freaks and filthy friends alike? Filthy Dan coming at you for another film discussion, and tonight what we are going to do is take a nice deep dive into the annals of a forgotten 80s slasher. We're going to pick one of the more obscure titles that has only recently come back into the light through an Arrow release, which I do not own. I watched this one on Tubi. But we're going to be taking a look at a little forgotten piece of work called Edge of the Axe. So, Edge of the Axe stars Barton Fox, Christina Marie Lane, Paige Mosley, Fred Holliday, and Patty Shepard. Uh, it was directed by Jose Ramon Larraz, who is credited on screen as Joseph Brownstein. Now, this film, despite what most sources say, 1988, um, the official date I could find for release was September 15th, 1989. Um... But either way, it came out at the tail end of the 80s where there was plenty of MPA fuckery to go around butchering the films with great butcherings. Would have been great butcherings. But anyway, this film follows an axe murderer who terrorizes a small town in Northern California. Small, quaint little mountain town. And due to incompetent police work and denial of the murders oh no we haven't had a suicide or murder here since i became the sheriff chief whatever uh it leads two young locals to kind of take the investigation into their own hands and they they have these ideas that kind of keep us on a tail keep us on our fucking edge of our seats in a lot of ways trying to figure out who the killer is um, it really captivates a lot of the American slasher whodunit style with the whodunit of the giallo. Being that this is a Spanish-American film, it morphs those two together just fucking perfectly. And that's one thing throughout this film is they keep you guessing who the killer is. Uh, plenty of red herrings to go around. Uh, in a typical giallo fashion, everybody's a suspect. Again, in the typical slasher fashion. Everybody's a suspect. But, there, again, you got this guy going around with an axe. And this killer has this, it looks like a fucking clay mask. Like it's made out of fucking clay, but it's apparently like a cloth ski mask. Just with the eyes cut out. And wearing a poncho, carrying an axe, of course. Complete with black leather gloves. So, there's your giallo tip right there. But this killer goes around, um, you could guess again, with an axe murdering people. Uh, there, there's a lot of interesting kills in this film, but we'll kind of talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, one of our main characters is this guy called um, Gerald. And he meets this girl who works at one of the local pubs. And they come to bond over computers a little bit he says hey i'll give you this old computer so we can keep in touch play these games blah 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 apparently he builds his own computers so you know you had to throw in some late 80s um techno babble to i don't know keep it up to date but no it was a uh, it was kind of fun to see those big old fucking box monitors for the computers with the black screen with the green typing on it um but he meets this girl, and they kind of start taking a liking to each other over the course of a few days. And, you know, you, you kind of root for their relationship a little bit. Like, yeah, this guy's kind of a dweeb, but I saw a she in her own little way. So you're kind of rooting for them. Uh, her father owns one of the local taverns. Her father fucking mostly catches fish out of the nearby lake to sell at his restaurant. Like, I don't know, is that a house or a fucking restaurant? Um, I only saw this movie once, so I, I kind of let it sink in, but I probably should have rewatched it, but I don't know. It, it seems like a bed and breakfast. It's got the house, according to the housekeeper, has 29 doors inside of it. So it sounds like it's a good bed and breakfast, and there is like a bar with an arcade downstairs, so I I fully don't understand what it is. It, it seems to be a bar, but... The, the gentleman, Gordon, takes a liking to Lillian. Um, they're kind of palling around. Meanwhile, people are getting butchered off screen. Well, not off screen, but when they're not together. 
Uh, and of course, Gerald's going to be a red herring because every time she's trying to reach out to him on the computer, he's unable to answer. Suspect. Um, Gerald's buddy kind of disappears earlier on in the film. Jokes about killing his wife. Suspect. Like, there's even a small scale suspect in a man whose wife gets scared. Like, I was, I'm, I'm quick to point the finger at just about everybody in this film. Uh, of course, it's not going to be the sheriff because that's too easy. Um, the girl's father, perhaps? No. But there, there's this cool little character moment where Gerald and Lillian are hanging out together and she brings up this cousin that she had. They used to hang out all the time when they were little. And when they were about 10, she's pushing him on the swing. She's pushing him on the swing. Swing keeps getting higher and she's like, look, her cousin Charlie's like, no, stop. Lillian, stop. And he flies off the swing and fractures his skull. And after they're talking about that, she notices that Gerald has a little fucking scar on the bottom of his head, which he dismisses really quickly as being a motorcycle accident that he doesn't want to talk about. Also good to know that Gerald is new in town. Um, but the Char the cousin Charlie has been in the hospital for the last several years in, uh, I don't know, kind of like a mental ward because his brain has not been able to recover. And th this really throws Tr Gerald as being a candidate for Charlie. And that, that was an intriguing little got you by the balls, keeps you guessing type thing. Uh, all these people getting killed off are revealed to be um, closely associated with the cousin Charlie. Whether they were a doctor or some other staff member, maybe a hairdresser. And Gordon finds this out that um, he finds out that Lillian has been actually trying to search information about Charlie that says he left the hospital about a year ago. Raises a big red motherfucking flag, don't it? Um, but yeah, it, it's crazy how this fucking shit winds up going down because at the end of the movie, like at the end, because aside from killing and a lot of me, it feels like this film meanders, but after a lot of back and forth between character moments and killings, character moments and killings, slight mention of the investigation, killings, character moments, it breaks down to Lillian's at her house and she's on the computer just trying to reach out to Gerald. And the names of all the victims come up on the computer and mentions how they're all associated with the mental hospital. Gerald then comes into the house, black gloves on. No poncho, strangely enough. No poncho. He did have a similar poncho earlier. But he comes into the house with the black gloves and he's he approaches Lillian. And she assumes that he is Charlie. Which is what most of us had assumed up to this point also. And real quick, this is kind of where the film gets into heavy spoiler context. Um, as if the last little bit I've said hasn't. This is where it gets massive spoilers, so skip ahead like 30 seconds. Um, basically, Gerald tells Lillian that she in fact is Charlie. Because there is no Charlie. Charlie was a fabrication of her imagination because she had an injury where she was at the hospital and she suffered this psychotic disorder and fabricated Charlie to kind of escape from it, create like a sort of a second life to, I don't know, kind of build a parallel so that she didn't have that stigma of being in the asylum. So Charlie was a fabrication of her own mind and she thinks that Gerald is fucking with her. And at this point, we don't know exactly if he's being straight up or not. But Gerald keeps kind of grilling her and just telling her that, yes, she is Charlie. Telling Lillian that she is Charlie. But there is no Charlie. That it's in her head. He's just 
letting her know this, letting her know it. But she, at this point, she fucking loses her shit, grabs an axe that's nearby that she was using to defend herself because she thought that the killer was in the house. In a way, the killer kind of was. But she grabs the axe, charges at Gerald. He tries to stop her. They tumble down the stairs. He winds up picking up the axe and tells her that she needs to chill. She needs to calm down so they can move on, start a new life together somewhere else. And she's like, no, breaks free, runs outside. At this moment, the police are pulling up, showing their one bit of competence in a horror movie, showing up in the final act. So you got Lillian running outside screaming, ah, help, help. Gerald's got the axe and the police fucking shoot him dead. Ends with the sheriff hugging her, telling her, hey, the nightmare's over. And you get that fucking close-up shot on her face with a sinister grin. Psh. And credits start rolling. Um, yeah, so this is one of those the villain wins type of horror films. And like this one was kind of tricky to talk about because I don't know, I find that the ones that are heavy on the Giallo-esque side are sometimes harder to break down. And this one, I won't say is a full Giallo, but it has the tendencies in a lot of ways. But I'm going to go into what I did like about this film. Now, one thing I liked was the setup of the killer. Um, like, not, not so much the setup. I mean, of course, the build-up to showing us the killer was pretty cool. With the uh, opening kill in a car wash. Uh, that's something I've never really seen done in a slasher, I don't think. But you got this lady going through one of those car washes. You got the people giving the little pre-soaping and pre-rinsing and all that fun shit. And then she goes into the car wash. And this fucking killer with the poncho comes in. Psh, axes her to death in her fucking car. Um, but the look of the killer is pretty fucking cool plain white mask looks like fucking clay as I said looks like a clay mask but it's like cloth has the poncho complete with gloves one simple murder weapon which is an axe which leads us into the next thing I really enjoy axe kills are fucking amazing and every kill in this film is done by a fucking axe um, it doesn't get any more hardcore than that axe kills are I Axe kills are a lot of fun, especially when done right. And a lot of them are really handled pretty well in this film. So, um, I, di I did enjoy most of the kills, which we'll segue into. I did enjoy the kills despite the, the, tone down, the toning down of them as far as blood and gore goes. But the kills are still fucking a sight to behold. Uh, also, I also did like some of the character moments, the setting up the red herrings. And we'll actually talk about the different red herring setups that they used in this film. I mean, you have Gerald's buddy, I, I forget his name, but again, he makes a joke about his, he wishes that his wife was dead, like, jokes about poisoning her and all that, only married her for her fortune and wealth. And he disappears for a good chunk of the movie. That kind of raises him suspect. There's this man whose wife is being uh, fucked with at the beginning like one of their pigs is slaughtered and the head's put in the bed but he's not seen at the house he has a one quick appearance at the sheriff's office yelling at the sheriff this guy must be caught I think you did it um of course the sheriff is always kind of a good suspect to go off of um Gerald was probably the heavy most heavy handed one uh, even the reverend at the church had a good uh, red herring bit. But, like, just coming off is really creepy. You know, the way they portray priests in films always being a little on the scary side. But the ones with Gerald were really heavy-handed, almost as if it was too obvious. And upon watching the ending, it... They definitely did play the hand of trying to trick you a little too heavy in that and trying to convince you that he was the bad guy. I mean, you see him chopping wood with an axe that ha that's wedge is painted the same way as the killer's axe that we see throughout the whole film. 
he disappears throughout the film, as does his friend. And biggest thing is the poncho. There is a scene where we see him wearing a rain poncho, very similar to what the killer wears. And it, it was all nice place stuff. Um, but the the eventual twist did kind of come out of nowhere. And I, I really did enjoy that for what it was. And again, the killer winning at the end of the day, I really like that kind of dark ending. Now, as for things I wasn't too big on in this film, uh, there there's one sequence, this is kind of a nitpick. It was a little character building moment where... Um, Richard, Gerald's friend Richard, uh, he's right. He's taking a speedboat with this gal who's one of the other. She's like she's the sister of Lillian, I think. But they're riding the boat on the water together, and you just got this really cheesy fucking song playing over it. And I mean, it's nowhere near as cheesy as the Silent Night, Deadly Night one, where you got Billy stocking groceries and whatnot. But I don't know. It, it was kind of a cringeworthy sequence that. I don't know, you just kind of needed it. There's a lot of these driving shots where they're driving on the road into town. And you got this fucking folky music playing. I, I didn't really like those interludes. But, I mean, that, that was my main dislike. But, I really didn't like the characters as well as I said they did try to build the relationships. Like, I appreciate the effort they made to make these characters. But I wasn't too big on the, a lot of the characters in this film. And the way they interacted, a lot of it was just really kind of fucking dumb. Um, some of the acting, too, is a little a little iffy. But, I mean, it's a late 80s, low-budget slasher film. That is a two-country production. So, you, you get some acting by Spanish actors who don't really know what kind of film they're working on so they deliver a certain kind of performance that doesn't really fit with the horror film if that makes sense and even among the main characters like they kind of get along but um like this is kind of off topic but some of the actors look like dollar store versions of other actors like the character who plays richard i think that was uh page mosley uh he looks like a dollar store Tom Cruise whenever he's wearing sunglasses on the boat like that early 90s Tom Cruise almost and fucking what what's his nuts Gerald kind of looks like a dollar store Mark Hamill and like, I, I kind of couldn't get over that and there, there were a few other ones where it's like hey dollar store so and so dollar store this guy I think there was a dollar store Michael Ironside in here too so that's always pretty cool but yeah, one thing that I kind of am in the middle on is the graphic content of the kills. Uh, the kills, again, were fucking awesome just for being axe murders. But being so late in the 80s, and I stress this anytime I'm talking about a late 80s slasher, they really toned down the gore because the MPA had their fucking hard on for taking out gore in horror films. So this film kind of did suffer from that. But the effects we do get to see are pretty cool. Um, there's some moments where you don't even see blood coming off uh, the off of any of the wounds when the axe is being fucking hit. But, you know, we, we get a fair share in here. So the, the gore, I would say, is kind of mid-rate. Anyway, guys, let's move on to the filthy features. And as we always do, we will start with the favorite kill and there's quite a few to choose from because i'm a sucker for axe murders uh but the one that really worked for me was this character anna bixby and she's like the the head of the church choir and she's like a total fucking karen from the late 80s she's kind of really bitchy when we see her and i don't remember exactly what they were talking about but it was just fucking town gossip like, this person's crazy, they should be locked up, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's definitely this guy, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, it's not that guy, darling. I know it's not him, I don't know who it is, but I know it's not the guy you're saying it is. So she was being real bitchy about it. But anyway, we see her going to her house. 
And she's calling for a dog who has, like, the most fucking human name ever. And I remember saying, oh, bitch, you should die just for naming your dog that. It was, like, Jeffrey or some shit. Like, who the fuck names their dog? Like, the most human name you could give it. But, anyway, she goes upstairs, notices that her dog's throat has been slit. Runs downstairs, goes to go out the door. Fucking gets her fingers hacked off with the axe. Runs through the house and tries to use her fucking a little glass door inside the house that goes from one room to the next. Tries to block the killer out of there. Killer, of course, gets through that. No fucking problem. Hacks her to death. Again, it's really a lot of the elements surrounding it. And that's why I almost went with the car wash kill. Just for how more or less unique that was. I really did fucking enjoy that. Uh, let's move on to the smutty sightings. Wait a second. There's not much smut here. Uh, all we really get to see is the character Lillian changing. And we don't even see all that much. We get a little back shot of her. Really tame shot. I don't even think we see her ass cheeks completely. But you see Lillian changing into a dry pair of clothes. Uh, that, that was it for the sightings of Smut. I'm very disappointed in that. Add that to my dislikes. But, I mean, overall, uh, Edge of the Axe is one that I think has potential to grow on me. I found it to be pretty, um, pretty generic mid-tier. I mean, it, it's cool that it's um, kind of a lost gem of the 80s. I, it's one that I was curious to check out for how, despite how bland the cover was, where you just see the killer's face, just that white fucking, almost like they're trying to rip off Michael Myers, but probably not. But you see the white face on the poster with the eyes, fucking silver and blue letters saying Edge of the Axe. The cover doesn't say a whole lot, but it's intriguing enough. And that, that was enough to make me want to check this out. And I'm kind of glad I did. Again, this one has... It wasn't that great, but it has potential to grow on me with repeat viewings. I enjoyed it for what it was, but... Like, after I give it a couple more watches, I probably won't be revisiting it anytime soon, but... Like, ch check it out if you want. It, I'm not going to give it too high of a praise on this one. As always, thank you all for watching. Please be sure to like and share this video, and if you have not already, stab the fuck out of that subscribe button. And if you're feeling extra filthy, go ahead and leave a comment down in the comment section below. Why were 80s films so tech-obsessed? I really want to know the answer to that. What do y'all think? As always, stay filthy.